And so I think any investor in any particular market or asset class, your competitive advantage is that market knowledge. Welcome to episode 209 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter, and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by Arn Sinadella, founder of Spark Investment Group. With over four decades of real estate experience, both as a broker and investor, Arn transitioned to investing in multifamily real estate in 2020. Throughout our conversation, Arn shares why real estate agents are at an advantage when it comes to investing themselves, why he made that transition to multifamily investments, and tips for making sure you are both investing in the right properties and partnering with the right people. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story of real estate success or tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new guests to inspire our listeners. And lastly, if you enjoy this conversation and want to hear more, be sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents Podcast. We stream on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. All right, let's get on with our conversation with Arn Sinadella. If you'd like to learn more about real estate investing or Spark Investment Group, be sure to check out the episode description or go to investwithspark.com. Well, really, the way I like to get everything started is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit. Uh, you know, I know you have a, a long, extensive background in real estate. Um, but tell me, tell me kind of a brief backstory on that. Yeah. So, Michael, uh, pleasure to meet you. Thanks for having me on the show. And hopefully we can help your listeners, you know, kind of achieve their goals and move, move their investing career along, too. So uh, very thankful to be here. So I had, had a kind of a typical middle income American lifestyle. Parents said, go to school, work hard, uh, do well in school, go to college, yada, 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 and uh, ended up going all the way to University of Michigan for grad school, got a master's degree in physical chemistry of every uh, of all things, and then uh, wanted to return to the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up. So I called my dad. He said, well, come on out, get your license, and I'll put you to work. So he was a residential broker in Menlo Park in Palo Alto, California, which is basically turned into Silicon Valley. So I was blessed to sell single family homes and invest in single family homes in probably the world's greatest residential market uh, and did that for about 35 years. Right. And, and obviously, you know, that market in your time, you saw the change that happened in there, you know, tell me about, just tell me a little bit about that, what that was like going through such an explosive growth. Yeah. Uh, well, one, for one is it was exciting. And I can remember we'd be going around on broker tour caravan. I'm sure you have that in your area too. And we'd be going, how can prices get any higher? And sure enough, five years later, they were higher. So when I started in March of 1978, you know, most of the houses were maybe two, three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, and you could actually have them make sense as rentals. By the time I left in 2014, really the price tag was more two, three, four million dollars, and of course those don't make much sense as rentals. Uh, but obviously, Silicon Valley changed the world. Back when I was a kid. Um, Libby Can Food Company was actually the biggest employer. It was an agriculture area, apricots, strawberries, and so forth. And, uh, you know, some brilliant people got together and kind of created an environment and energy, and the, the rest is kind of history. So it's totally changed our lives. Right, absolutely. So, you know, for, uh, for our conversation, I really want to talk to you about, um, you know, your investing career and how that all uh, happened and, and how you got into investing and then really what you're doing now. Um, so I, I guess to kind of start off, tell me about how you yourself got interested in real estate investing as a broker. Or, you know, as a Yeah. So uh, my father was my first mentor. Uh, 
you know, my vision of life growing up, I was going to be a research scientist or a professor and then just decided I really needed more social interaction on a day to day basis. And of course, in real estate, you're always meeting people. That's part of the fun part of the job. And uh, my dad early on in my career, I was probably 22 and of course, thought I knew everything. I was a young whippersnapper. And of course, I didn't know everything. But he sat me down and he said, hey, Arn, the real estate brokerage is a great vehicle to create income. It's a great business to be in. If you do it right, you work hard, you can make significant income levels. But he said to really generate wealth, financial freedom, financial security, however you want to describe that, really the key is investing. So early on, it was kind of, yes, use the brokerage to generate income and you have to live below your means. And that delta, you need to put to work for you as an investor. And my father was a single family investor uh, interestingly enough, never moved to multifamily. When he scaled out a single family, he went to multi-tenant offices, which is a little different than my journey. But he was a single family home investor, and I just kind of followed in his footsteps, started accumulating a few rentals in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then also had the good fortune to get into the Austin, Texas market probably 20, 25 years ago. And of course, we all know what's happened in Austin. So uh, basically, my father was my mentor. He did single family rentals. And that's how I kind of got into it. And uh, I've been kind of doing it ever since. Right. And that's, I mean, that's great to have, some, you know, a mentor like that, let alone your father, get, you know, kind of helping, you know, um, you know, pave the way and, and show you how important that investing side things that you have all the access as, you know, as an agent and in the real estate industry, you have access to all the the market analysis and, and all those things. It really is beneficial uh, when you're looking to invest yourself. Yes. And uh, we were talking before we started the recording about maybe not enough agents actually kind of invest and how perhaps they're missing an opportunity there. And I would say in whatever asset class you're investing in, whether it's stock or Bitcoin, I don't understand Bitcoin. I can't figure it out. I don't invest in it. I, I, I can't understand it, so I'm not going to do it. And so I think any investor in any particular market or asset class, your competitive advantage is that market knowledge, as you mentioned. And so as real estate professionals, we're out in the market. We're seeing dozens of homes every day. We're transacting 20, 30, 40 sales a year. So we should really know those local markets. And I think that then leads to opportunity. So I think you're exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, even I know in our market here, we have so many, um, you know, investors that are, you know, buying properties and, you know, the agents that are working with those investors, those are great people to pick the brains of. Yes. And uh, investors, investor buyers, they're maybe not as concerned about what the color of the carpet is or what what type of granite is there or, or, or anything. So I think you can find it, investors can often make decisions more quickly. They're maybe tending to look more at the big picture, the area growth, population growth, job growth. They can run the numbers quickly. And so it's a little less emotional. And uh, the other thing I would say is when you find an investor client, they're usually not just buying one property. And so you do a good job for that investor they're going to come back to you for the next deal and so on and so forth. And as you mentioned, you can learn from there. Those investors kind of learn how they look at investing and so forth. So it's a good supplement to your owner occupied business. And and many agents actually prefer working with investors. It, it, it's it's not quite as emotional and maybe sometimes it's not quite as time urgent because it's more business than than 
where where's my family going to live and and you know and all of that and both are great i did both and i enjoyed both right it, it, for you when you got started investing and, and really throughout your investing career in the um you know the single family uh, side of things i will definitely touch on the the multifamily and the syndication in a, in a moment but um you know, for a lot of, uh, you know, folks that might be wanting to get into investing that are interested in, you know, maybe having one or two rental properties in their, in their market. Uh, what are some of the things that you used to look for in the properties? Yes. Great question. So, um, number one, in terms of rentals, uh, I kind of never wanted to be at the, the low end of the rent schedule. If that makes sense. I never wanted to be at the high end. I didn't want a luxury rental. I didn't necessarily want a low income rental. I kind of wanted what I would call steak and potatoes, bread and butter, middle income rentals, because I think that's where your biggest demand is. And these residents have stabilized jobs and income. Often they have a dream of buying a house in a couple years. So they understand their credit's important to them. This rental for a couple years is maybe only a stop to the next step. So try to find things in kind of that middle affordable to your median income in your county. I think that's one. They're strong demand and they're, they're excellent residents. Uh, then certainly, you know, location, uh, if you can start to invest in areas that you're seeing improving and maybe perhaps get a little ahead of the curve, I think that's where ultimately you're going to get your best bang in the buck, uh, best bang for the buck. Certainly there are type A neighborhoods, prime neighborhoods that everybody knows about and they're priced accordingly. I think you can find neighborhoods that are on the improve. And as realtors, we're out. We know where people are flipping houses. We know where these abandoned storefronts are being turned into cool coffee shops. Uh, where are the younger, educated college, recent college graduates moving. So you can kind of identify what area is going to kind of pick up. And if you can invest in that type of neighborhood, you're going to do well. And then I think the third and final thing is understanding cheap or inexpensive doesn't mean value. And uh, houses and buildings have quality uh, and, and so what I always kind of say is buy quality properties and quality locations because ultimately the quality will come through and people who have remodeled homes know if you have a nice home and it's got the perfect floor plan and the room sizes are good and everything works and it's all you have to do is put a fresh cosmetic shell on it, right? Paint, flooring, countertops. That's an easy renovation. That's an easy upfit. On the other hand, if you got a house where the kitchen's too small or there's no master bath and you got to start tearing out walls and moving plumbing, it becomes more expensive. So I think when you're evaluating these houses, look for that kind of quality, solid floor plan uh, because you'll be able to more cost effectively kind of increase the value and therefore the rent of the property. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, having that experience as the real estate professional in your market uh, is, is so great because you know what the demographics are, you know, places change, the demographics and areas change and what might've worked, you know, for a, a solid property 20 years ago, maybe doesn't work anymore because the, the demographics of the area has changed. And I think that's so important. Correct. Uh, what was it? Uh, so, you know, you were in um, the uh, the single family space. What was it that made you want to expand out and, and go more the, the multi? Yeah, that that that's an interesting question. So uh, uh, about 10 years ago, moved clear across the country to Greenville, South Carolina. Didn't know anybody, kind of took a leap of faith. The Bay Area is great. Uh, Laura and I spent most of our lives there. Laura had a 
Silicon Valley career, uh, Intel, Visa, Intuit, and I was in the brokerage. So moved to Greenville, started developing relationships with um, local investors, the local real estate community, and uh, happened to befriend a young guy uh, who, when I first met him, he was just starting to flip houses. And six years later, right about spring of 2020, and if we reflect back, that's when COVID was kind of, we kind of knew COVID was a big deal and, you know, March of 2020. So Mario calls me up and he goes, well, Lauren, what do you think is going to happen with rent collections? And I go, ah, Mario, I don't know. Talk to me in April because I had already collected the March rent. And so I I call me April 5th and then we'll know. So at the end of it, the conversation, he said, hey, I've been starting to get into multifamily investing. And here's a podcast that I think you should listen to. And so... I listened to the podcast and kind of a light bulb went off in my mind about the benefits of multifamily investing over single family. And over a period of a couple months, consumed a lot of podcasts, uh, joined some online training groups and really kind of learned the business and it made sense to me. And so uh, in short, I would say number one, Um, I think we all realize, recognize we have a housing shortage in this country, and it's particularly short at the affordable range. I mean, there's no problem finding $3 million houses. I mean, that's not the problem. It's more, how do you find housing on a middle income, lower middle income, et cetera? So I think apartments fill that need for just about the most affordable housing in the United States. I mean, mobile homes would be the other one, which are where rents are generally at the lower level and more accessible for a lot of people. So that's number one. Number two, uh, as great as it is having 20 rental houses in your community and buying single family rentals is a tried and true way to create wealth and financial security. So nothing I'm going to say is negative about that, but just think you have 20 houses all spread out, say through your County. They're all different. Uh, As opposed to owning a 20 unit apartment building where all 20 income sources are right there on the same property. So having them localized makes management easy. And the other thing we really love is generally in a 20, 30, 40 unit apartment building, you might have one or two floor plans. Maybe you got a one bedroom plan, you got a two bedroom plan. Well, after you renovate one of each, they're identical. So you, you, you already know what you need to do to, to, to renovate the next one. And so for like us, when we renovate a unit, we know exactly how much counter space, how much or countertop, how much LVP, how much carpet, what light fixtures, what vanities. And we put these orders in with home and Lowe's, Home Depot and Lowe's. And so we'll just call them up and go, Hey, we need two material packages for the cottages at Staunton Bridge, for example. And the next day we pick them up and we're not running back and forth trying to, you know, I forgot a part or, oh, I didn't measure this correctly. So I think there's a lot of economies of scale by having similar units and being able just to rinse and repeat that. You could think about it, you know, if you've ever flipped houses every freaking house is pretty much different. And so you got to reinvent the wheel every time and that slows you down and maybe makes mistakes. Uh, And then the final one I would say is multifamily typically tends to be more a team sport where often single family investing is more an individual a individual or a couple buy some rental houses, maybe they have a property manager, but that's kind of about as far as it goes, where the multifamily deals are bigger. And so you can actually form partnerships with two or three people to help 
you operate the property. And I would submit each of us has particular strengths and abilities. We have things we like to do and we're good at. We have things we hate to do and aren't good at it. And so with the multifamily, you're able to partner with people who have skill sets that you don't uh, and, and kind of maximize your ability. Um, in my team, it's basically three person team. I'm kind of the deal front, the deal finder. I go out and hunt the properties. I talk to the brokers. I network. I raise capital. Brian is the one who has responsibility for running the day to day asset. And he does a great job. He does a better job than I can do. And he loves doing it. And then Dan is kind of uh, the analyst, the underwriter, the CFO. He's kind of the brain. He crunches all the numbers. And so the three of us together have a good team and it's really solid. And I think the team does better. So I enjoy the partnership and team aspects of it also. Yeah, absolutely. And and for somebody that's looking to, um, you know, uh, get into uh, investing, uh, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, I talk to a lot of folks that are, you know, they think that the barrier of entry is, is just out of their out of their realm. But when you are partnering with people and you're going, you know, you're able to put these these deals together uh, on the multifamily, it, it takes you know, I, I think that barrier of entry is a little bit less because you can kind of partner with people. Yes, for sure. So uh, uh, one of the things I love doing is meeting some folks, having a beer and talking real estate. So within the local Greenville community, I developed friendships with people. Maybe there were a couple guys I flipped a couple houses with and we did that and that was all great. And so on my first multifamily, true multifamily deal, which was a 12 unit building, uh, it was, I think we paid about a million bucks for it. We needed to raise, I think the down payment was maybe 350,000. So myself and four buddies, we each kind of ponied up 50, 75,000 each and bought this property. That was about four years ago. We still own it to today. And so, yes, you can partner with people to acquire these, these larger assets. And so, uh, I think that's certainly a viable way to do it. Uh, and again, for real estate professionals, uh, who are out there, no other real estate professionals, no other buyers and sellers, I think it should be fairly straightforward to find partners who also want to invest in real estate. So I, I'd encourage you to kind of explore um, uh, those options. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even just your, your, your database of past clients, you know, I have to imagine that if, if you've been in the, the real estate game for you know, 10 years, you probably have some, have some past clients that maybe have purchased their own investment properties that, you know, could be great people to go in and partner with. Uh, 100%. So my partner, Brian, for example, he has a property management company here in Greenville, maybe manages about 500 houses. And it kind of took me about a year of, let's call, courting him to come to multifamily. He goes, I'm a single family guy, blah, blah, blah. I go, come on, Brian, let, let, let's give this a try. So we do what's called syndications. And so we'll raise money from 20, 30, 40 investors. And again, it doesn't have to be big bucks. We raise it 25, 50,000 at a time. And a lot of our investors are Brian's property management clients. They're happy owning a couple rentals, but they also, so, so they understand the value of real estate and the benefits of investing in real estate, but maybe they don't want another two or three rentals because that takes up more of their time. So with the syndication or joint venture kind of set up, uh, their day-to-day -day involvement is less they still have their capital invested in real estate as opposed to say the stock market. So they're still in real estate, 
but basically we handle the headaches for them and they don't have to deal with it. So I think you're exactly right. There'll be people in as a broker agent in your community, there'll be people in your database that do want to invest, but maybe they don't have the time to go find the property. Maybe they don't want to get a call about a stopped up toilet uh, or that, you, you know, they're just busy with their lives and they don't want to deal with it. So I would say that's fertile ground to kind of investigate. And uh, again, I think my advice would be never be kind of pushy about it. What I found the best way to go about it is just kind of share what you're doing. And it could be as little as, you know, hey, Joe, uh, a couple of buddies and I, we just bought this eight units over here and this is what we're doing. And I think what you'll find, people will raise their hand and they'll go, well, hey, next time you find something, please let me know. So it's not like you're trying to sell them anything, just sharing what you're doing. The people who are interested will kind of self-identify because we know you go to cocktail parties. What's everybody talking about? It's real estate, what this house sold for, what this house. So people love real estate and uh, they understand it. And so if you provide another way for them to invest in it, I think it's a winning, winning approach. Right. And I actually, I was, I heard you on a, a previous uh, podcast you were on talking about sharing, uh, you know, articles or uh, things about, you know, the specific communities that you yes. are, uh, you know, that you have properties in or looking to purchase a property in and, and sharing that with your database to kind of educate them on the, the up and comingness of a market. Yes, uh, precisely because you may, uh, and in your market, uh, St. Augustine, you probably have local owners, but you probably have a fair number of out of area owners, right? That maybe own a second home or a winter home or, you know, do an Airbnb or whatever. So uh, reaching out to those folks, kind of letting them know, well, Toyota's opening a plant here or Boeing's coming in with a facility or, or they're revitalizing the downtown. It's just good to let people know kind of what's going on. And when you're looking at an area and you're seeing significant amount of capital being invested in it, those people are pretty smart. And and, and so you might pay attention that, hey, if if some hedge fund or Blackstone or whoever or GE is going into an area and investing money, that means they see something in that market that's going to be positive long term. Yeah. And, I, and kind of on that uh, topic, um, let's say I was ready to, uh, you know, put some money down and invest in a multifamily and I wanted to get into you know, a syndication or something like that. Um, who should I be looking to do business with? What are some of those what are some of those tips to making sure that I am protected in you know my investment? Yeah, that that, that that's a great question. So um, first, let me uh, indicate there are typically two types of syndications. five oh six c c is in Charlie. Those are available to accredited investors only. And an accredited investor is someone with a net worth of $1 million or more exclusive of their primary residence. So you can't count your home. Or it's a single with an income of over 200 a year or a couple of over 300 a year. So 506C syndications are open to accredited investors only and they can be advertised meaning you'll see them on social media and so on and so forth. The other type of syndications, the ones we typically do are so-called 506B, which are open to accredited investors, but they're also open to what's called a sophisticated investor. And what a sophisticated investor means is, one, their financial house is in order. Uh, two, they have sufficient financial knowledge to kind of properly assess the risk and rewards of investing in syndications. 
Now, with the 506B, you actually have to make contact with somebody like me or other operators before you can be presented deals. So with 506B deals, we can't send out a blast to Facebook. We got 40 units in Greenville, can't do it. So uh, if you're interested in syndications, I think if you just kind of Google it, if you like Phoenix, Arizona as a market, Google Phoenix multifamily syndications and see who pops up. Um, so just a couple tips. Uh, one, uh, if someone's really pressuring you or kind of making outrageous promises, that to me would be a big red flag and I'd probably back away. Uh, number two, I think you'll want to have operators uh, who have a presence in a particular market with a particular type of property. And so what I mean by that is uh, apartments are typically rated A, B, C. A are those brand new luxury downtown ones with all the bells and whistles, 3000 a month rent. And then B are your 1990 garden style apartments, you know, they're fine, they're perfectly livable. And then C are kind of the older, smaller apartments. And so you, if, if you talk to an operator who has five class C buildings in Dallas and has been operating them, and then all of a sudden brings you a fancy class A building in Dallas, again, I would take a little pause because the approach that works for these lower class properties, smaller, less expensive rentals, older properties may not be the same approach you want for a 2024 building right in downtown. Or for example, if somebody's done four or five deals in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then all of a sudden brings you one in Boise, Idaho, again, I may take a pause. So there's an expression, horses for courses, and they're operators for particular property. In my case, we only do Greenville County. It's where we're located. I believe in local knowledge. All the assets are, are 30 minutes from us. Uh, so that's all we do. I'm not doing a deal in Nashville. I'm not doing a deal in Atlanta. It's not my market. I'm not an expert. So as you evaluate these operators, make sure they kind of have a track record in this particular location or type property. Um, and then I think the other thing is, as we go on in life, we develop a skill to kind of evaluate people and make a decision, is what I'm hearing make sense to me? Does this person seem like they're above board transparent and, and speaking to me with character and integrity? So I would also rely on kind of your, your personal vibe, the vibe you get when talking to this person. Is it one that inspires trust or is it one where you're putting your hand on your wallet because uh, you're getting some strange signals. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, and I think all those things really resonate with, uh, you know, the, the real estate agent uh, listener that we have, because, you know, as a, as a home buyer, I'm not going to use somebody that's based out of Miami to sell me a home in St. Augustine if they don't have the market knowledge. You know, I think that that same, uh, you know, the same kind of principles. Uh, yes. Character. Yes. And and uh, what I would say is don't go all in in your first deal. Uh, one of the advantages of being a limited partner, an LP investor, a passive investor is you can spread your investments out. You could buy a, a class, buy into a part of a class B building in St. Petersburg. You could buy part of a class A building in Austin, Texas. You could buy a workforce housing in Colorado Springs. So you're able to diversify by geography and asset class. And so uh, 
I always say the proof's in the pudding. So maybe make a few smaller investments, see how the operators do, and it'll become obvious to you who's the one you should do your next deal with. And it's same with an agent. If you're a buyer or seller, you're going to interview a couple agents and, you know, what's the vibe you're getting? Do, do you feel like you're heard? Are you listened to? Do you feel like they have your best interest in heart and you make an assessment that way? Yeah, absolutely. Well, before I let you go, I'd love to have you tell me about uh, Spark Investment Group and, and what you guys uh, are doing now and kind of what the what the future is holding. Yes. So uh, let me just cover one topic before that, which I think is really critical for real estate professionals. So uh, there's something called real estate professional status. And uh, generally, I would say most full-time agents will qualify for this, but Again, anytime you're dealing with taxes or the IRS or the IRS code, consult professionals. But if you're a real estate professional, you can use the depreciation these rental properties generate against your commission income. And, and that's not true for most people. For most earners, if they make over 150,000 AGI, they can't use the paper rental losses to offset and reduce their income. So as a real estate professional, you have a really great benefit that Investing in real estate provides because it will actually help reduce your taxable income. So investigate that. Think about that. Make sure you understand what real estate professional status is. Uh, so I call it sometimes the keys to the kingdom. And uh, we all like to minimize taxes. It just means you keep more of your capital and you have more that you can grow over time. So anyway, to reach out to me, I'm very active on social media, either under Arn Sinadella or Spark Investment Group, both on Facebook and LinkedIn. Website is investwithspark.com. And uh, my site contains lots of education about single family, extensive blogs. I've got a whole library of podcasts there. So there is quite a bit of educational material. And if people ever want to just reach out and talk, just reach out uh, through the website and we'll schedule a call, no obligation, and I'll just kind of answer questions. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time uh, and, and speaking with us. I think, you know, I, I've Lately, I feel like over the last year, some of the more, uh, some of the younger agents that I've talked to, they are actually really, um, forward thinking and are investing in real estate themselves now more than I had, you know, uh, people I talked to even four years ago when I first started this. Yeah. And yeah. So it's also fun to invest. Now, as a real estate agent, I'm sure we've all had this experience. You find the perfect house. The price is good. It's exactly what the person needs. And they don't quite see it. And you as a professional know this is a good deal and it's the perfect house for you. But of course, it's the client's decision and you have to buy by their, 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 their ultimate decision. But once you become an investor, you get to make the decisions and follow through on your beliefs. Uh, and so it's kind of freeing in that way uh, because then you're more able to kind of move nibble quickly to, to secure opportunities as you see them in the market. So uh, I love being a broker, but uh, I enjoy being an investor more. So uh, th that's my two cents. Awesome. Well, again, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with us today. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks, Michael. I want to thank Arn for joining us today and sharing all of his tips for agents looking to open up additional streams of income and invest in real estate themselves. Remember, if you want to learn more, be sure to check out investwithspark.com. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. 
Well, that wraps things up for this episode. But remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.